Amen. You have your Bibles, dear saints. For our guests, you're going you're gonna to want to get used to bringing your Bible. <laughs> I just want to give a warm welcome to you. Many of you have been attending the seminar. And I just want to welcome you to be here to worship with us. And open the Word of God together. Get this. Okay, very good. It's hard to believe we are coming to a rapid conclusion here. But we still want God to speak to us today. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Oh, Father in heaven, please hear our prayer this morning. Thank you for the prayers that have been said, the time that we have spent. And now, as we open your word, give clarity, give power, give understanding. Help us, Lord, to make decisions for your glory. Please speak through me, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dreams, visions, modern prophets. The Bible says that there will be false prophets, there will be false Christs. Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus warns us that they will arise to show great signs and wonders to do what? Again, in Matthew 7, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. We spent time looking at the counterfeit. There is a counterfeit in the last days. But here's the thing. If there is a counterfeit, then there must be the genuine. A, a counterfeit can fool only because there's a genuine. You'll never be fooled by a $3 bill because there is no real $3 bill. You catch what I'm saying? I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. The reason why the devil wants to counterfeit the prophetic gift is because God has a genuine gift of prophecy in the last days of earth's history. Ephesians 4 verse 8 says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And what did he do? He gave gifts to men. Now, if Jesus is going to give gifts, don't you want to receive that gift? I don't want to miss a gift that Jesus wants to give. So what are these gifts? Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. He gave himself, what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. Do we need these gifts in the church today? Pastors, teachers, certainly we need these gifts in the church. Why? For the equipping of, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God would put his gifts in his church to equip, to edify, to strengthen it in the last days of earth's history. And one of those gifts would be the gift of prophecy. His church would be blessed with visions and dreams. That's what scripture says. How long will these gifts remain in the church? Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. They would be present until the day Christ would come again. Why again? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. God wants us to be sound in the faith. Can I hear an amen? amen? So Jesus would give his church gifts. One of them would be the gift of prophecy and they would remain in the church until when? The second coming, until we come to spiritual completeness. When we are truly indeed ready for Jesus to come again. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you come short in no gift. So the Bible says that the church that is waiting for Jesus to come again would come short in no gift. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So if you're looking for truth, if you and I want truth, if we're looking for God's true people on earth, then we're going to be looking for an end time people who are anticipating, one, the second coming of Christ. How many of you here are looking forward to Jesus coming again? Amen. If we are looking for God's end time people, it must be a people who are looking forward to Jesus coming again. Incidentally, it must be an Adventist church. <laughs> That's what Advent means. It means looking for Jesus to come. It needs to be Bible-based, grace-filled, Christ-centered. It needs to be law-abiding, Sabbath-keeping. We spent time on this in the seminar. But now, it also must be a church, a movement guided by the gift of prophecy. That's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. Jesus promised that the gift of prophecy would be revived in the last days. The reason why we're seeing such an explosion of interest in the supernatural is because Satan is working his deception. Now, there are two great dangers. The first danger is that you accept the counterfeit. You don't want to do that. Millions of people, they're wanting this supernatural experience, and they're going to accept this counterfeit because it's based on that feeling, based on that desire for the supernatural. But there's a second danger. Some could be so skeptical of all of the false manifestations that they will reject the genuine. You see, the devil doesn't care which side of the ditch you fall in as long as you fall in the ditch. So how can we tell the difference between the true and the false? Six tests for the genuine gift of prophecy. And once you understand these tests, you can spot the difference between them a million miles away. You'll know whether it's the blessing of God or whether it is the curse of the enemy. That's why God says he would give his Holy Spirit that's why he gave it in the first place. Isaiah 59, 2. Why do we need this today? The Bible says, but your iniquities, what is that? Your sin, they have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. In the Garden of Eden, how did God communicate with man? Face to, to face. But after they sinned, God could no longer communicate with them that way. His glory would have consumed the sinner. So God had to find another way to communicate. He loved us so much, he wasn't going to just leave us alone, but he had to find a way to communicate his truth to us. Numbers 12, verse 6 says, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in what? In vision, I speak to him in a, in a dream. Two ways that God communicates with these biblical prophets. One, an angelic messenger descends from heaven. The prophet might be asleep. God would give them a dream. The prophet might be awake. God would give them visions. And then they go and they, they write out the visions and dreams that God had given them to share with God's people. To those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. There's a second way. God would use His Holy Spirit to impress their minds. So the Bible says all Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So God would speak through a vision or a dream, or he would impress the mind with the Holy Spirit. He would write it down. Now all God's prophets are not Bible writers. Take your Bible and open with me to the book of Agabus. <laughs> You say, Agabus isn't in the Bible. You're right, it's not. But Agabus was a true prophet. Notice this. Acts 11.27, in, the days, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named who? Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius 
Caesar. He was a true prophet, but he didn't write a book in the Bible. He was given at a time of crisis for the church. His message was for a specific time. Even the John the Baptist didn't have a book in the Bible. We find in the Bible there are women prophets. In the Old Testament, you have Deborah and Huldah. In the New Testament, you have the seven daughters of Philip. Some of them wrote books. Some of them didn't. They had a message for God's people at that time. So the biblical tests. How can you tell? Six tests. One, prophetic accuracy. They must be 100% correct. If, if someone's going to tell you something and you don't know whether it's 50% or 100%, you're going to be in trouble. Now this, of course, is if the prophecy is not conditional on the repentance of the people. Jeremiah 28 verse 9 says, As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So the word has to come to pass. God's true prophets are accurate because God doesn't confuse the message. They're not right some of the time. They're right all of the time. Now there are some cases, however, where the prophecy is conditional. We have the example of Jonah. He goes to Nineveh. And what did he say to the city? You're going to be destroyed in 40 days. Well, they repented. They listened to the message so God spared them. But Jonah was still a true prophet. If they had not repented, they would have been destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Second biblical test. Biblical faithfulness. A true messenger of God will lead, lead people to God's holy word. Prophets focus on the battle between good and and evil. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go what? After other gods. Be careful if a preacher is telling you to do things that are different from the word of God. That's what it's saying here. The Bible says, what you have not known, and let us serve them, going after these false gods, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commands, obey his voice. God says, my representatives will always point me, point you to me. They will always go back to scripture. They will never, ever go away from his revealed words. But in our seminar, we have seen how that has happened largely in the Christian church. It says, you shall serve him and full, hold fast to him. Let's hold fast to God. This passage is extremely significant. If the so-called prophet is not leading a person to the word of God to be faithful to scripture, they are blatantly false. Run from them because they're going to deceive you. Amen. Number three, they exalt Jesus Christ. Let's look at this clear passage of Scripture, 1 John 4, 1 and 2. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. We're not supposed to believe every spirit, but what are we supposed to do? Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The gift of prophecy leads people to Jesus. Revelation 19 tells us about this genuine gift of prophecy. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The true prophet bears witness of Christ for Christ. Number four, they are commandment keeping. All the prophets, all the Bible prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were raised at t up at times when God's people were breaking the commandments. They were to call them back to faithfulness to God. They called for obedience. They called for people to return to keeping God's commandments. Isaiah 8.20 says to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is how much light? No light in them. 
There would be physical tests to distinguish the true prophetic gift. Notice these. One, the prophet experiences visions with their eyes open. They remain open. Numbers 24, 4. Daniel 10, 8. They don't have any physical strength. They fall as if they are dead men. Prophets in vision do not breathe, Daniel 10, 17. God is sustaining the life of the biblical prophet. And number six, spiritual fruitage. God gives the gift of prophecy to bear spiritual fruit in the lives of the believers and the lives of his church. Matthew 7, 20, therefore by their fruits you shall know them. The gift of prophecy does not take the place of the Bible, it does what? It exalts it. Did you catch that? It does not take the place of the Bible, but God gives to get his people through the last days. Now what does God say about his last day church? Tonight we're going to get into this more clearly. You don't want to miss tonight as we're coming to the grand climax of this series. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged angry, furious with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who do what? Keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Two characteristics. They keep the commandments, they have the testimony of Jesus. Now, as we just saw, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here is what I want to make clear. God's last day people must have the gift of of prophecy. It is an identifying mark that God gives to his last day people. 1 Corinthians 2, 12, verse 28, and God has appointed them in the church, first apostles, second prophets. There would be prophets in the church. Now here's the question. Has God blessed the Seventh-day Adventist church with the gift of prophecy? This is the clear thing. If God has not restored this gift of prophecy, then he would not be faithful to his own word. Is God faithful? Absolutely. The Bible says that God is faithful. God cannot be unfaithful. God is faithful. He promised to restore it. God took a young woman, the weakest of the weak, only a third grade formal education and blessed her with prophetic visions and dreams. This woman was weak. She was prone to sickness, but her mind, her heart were open to God. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God gave her the genuine gift of prophecy. Her name was Ellen G. White. I'm going to give you a little history about her. She received more than 2,000 prophetic visions and dreams. Not one or two. How many? More than 2,000. Wrote over 50 books. Lectured to thousands on three continents. This is before you could go board an airplane and zip somewhere in a few hours. She was around the world. Last days of her life were spent... In California, I had a chance to visit this some years ago, this home. But there was a man by the name of George Wharton James. He was writing a history on California. In his book, California, Romantic and Beautiful, he commented on this simple, humble, godly woman. He says in his book that, now catch this, he's, I'm, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. He's a historian who's just simply writing a comment about her life. Page 319 in his book. He says, This remarkable woman, though almost entirely self-educated, has written and published more books in more languages which circulate to the greater extent than any other woman in history. She indeed was an incredible woman. But many... They, they see her life and they have questions. Does her prophetic gift replace the Bible? Now, we've already say, seen what Scripture says. So what's the answer? 
Absolutely not. People wonder, do Seventh-day Adventists, do they accept her word over the Bible? Or even equal to the Bible? I want to ask you, in this seminar, have I told you once to turn in your book, not the Bible, into the writings of Ellen White for the preaching of the gospel? You tell me. No. The Bible is the source of truth and doctrine. Seventh-day Adventists believe the Bible and in the Bible is the only one as a source of every Bible doctrine. Every teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church comes directly from the Holy Sacred Scriptures. That is the truth. But <laughs> if we are Bible-believing Christians, we have to accept the entire Bible, which also includes the part where God says he would restore the gift of prophecy. That makes sense? Even the prophetic message that might step on our toes now and then. <laughs> so let's apply these tests to Ellen White. Let's look at them briefly here. What about prophetic accuracy? One of the numerous subjects that she wrote on was health. Remember, she was living in the time of the 1800s. She wrote about sugar. People had no idea that sugar, that fat contributed to coronary heart disease. They didn't know that. She talked about a diet full of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, nuts. Now we think, oh, that's nothing. We have to remember the time when she wrote. This is the very diet that the American Heart Association recommends today. Scientific research proves that this is the best diet, that this is the diet that we should be eating to lessen our risk of cancer. This was, uh, this is Cornell University. Clive McKay from this university, he wrote this of Ellen White. This woman is 100 years of her time in the area of diet. How could she be 100 years ahead of time? Because God was giving her prophetic guidance. Back in the 1800s, Ellen White wrote a book called Ministry of Healing. In this book, page 327, she said, Tobacco is a slow, insidious, and most malignant poison. How many of you could agree with her on that today? Right? When she wrote this, doctors were recommending cigarettes to their patients. Children smoked. They believed that inhaling the, the smoke, it would cleanse the lungs. This was the 1800s. Ellen White wrote that tobacco was a malignant poison. It was going to lead to cancer long before scientific evidence proved it. Doctors smoked. They researched. They said, oh, our research says it's good for you. Today we know that smoking causes cancer. Many other diseases. Cigarettes are not just as pure as the water you drink. No researcher would disagree with her on this point today. How did Ellen White know the difference between the health fads of the day and sound science? In her day, things were crazy. There, were, there was so much mixed up information in the area of health. How did she know? How did she weed through it and collect the things that were right and, and that science is proving today? There's only one way. It's because God was leading her. God gave the gift of prophecy not to take the place of the Bible, but to help God's people in the last days. He placed it there so we'd have better health. Right, boys and girls? Ellen White wrote about the rise of the occult. She wrote about spiritualism and these bizarre cults that would, that would just be springing up in the last days. She predicted, predicted that there would be an explosion in the psychic, in the, in the astro astrology, in the communication with the dead. She predicted these things. They've come true. They're accurate. What about biblical faithfulness? Let's let her speak for herself. The Great Controversy, page 204, 205. In our time, she said, there's a wide departure from the doctrine from their doctrines and precepts. And there is a what? There is need of a return to the great Protestant principle. And what is that principle? The Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. The true gift of prophecy leads us back to the Bible. Now, if I wasn't clear yet, I'm going to say it in one statement. Seventh-day Adventists do not 
believe that Ellen White's writings in any way take the place of the Bible. They do believe that God graciously gave to the church the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that in visions and dreams, God would guide His church in the last days as He promised. What about exalting Jesus? In her book, Gospel Workers, she says, page 160, Lift up Jesus, you who teach the people. Lift Him up in sermon, in song, in prayer. Let all your powers be directed to pointing souls, confused, bewildered, lost to the Lamb of God. Can you say amen to that? Wouldn't we be much better in the Christian church if every pastor, every teacher pointed people to Jesus as the Lamb of God, to honor Him, to love Him, to be faithful to Him? I heard a child say amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. Ellen White's writings, they're filled with an emphasis on Jesus. This is the desire of ages about the life of Jesus. Christ's object lessons on the parables of Jesus. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Steps to Christ, to how to know Jesus for yourself. Her books lift up the living Christ. Amen. Commandment keeping, the fourth test. Prophets do not contradict prophets who have gone before them. Ellen White leads back to the obedience of God. She urges people to study the Bible for themselves. She urges us to lovingly keep His commandments. Now in the seminar, you did receive a book. You have to go look at it. The Great Hope. It's coming from some of her writings. It's a devotional look at this. It's a prophetic look at this. But you open that, you'll see over and over, she's saying, we need to get back to the Bible. We need to read the Scriptures. We need to test all things by the Scriptures. Physical tests. One of the physical tests is that a prophet does not... <gasps> see if you can hold your breath during this time here. Dr. Drummond, he was a skeptic. He said, no way, she's not a prophet. I cannot accept any dreams, he said, from a woman. I reject it. I know based on Daniel chapter 10 that you're not supposed to breathe in vision. He said, I'm a doctor. I'm going to examine her myself. So it just so happened that she had a vision. Not so happened. It was God's design. She was in vision. He comes up to examine her. He wrote this. She does not breathe. This is an unusual phenomenon. He himself became convinced, not just because of the physical test, but because she was leading people back to the Bible. She was promoting God's message to be preached. She was uplifting Christ. She was meeting all the biblical tests. But she also met this test. He became one of her strongest supporters. He noticed that she wasn't breathing during the vision. Her eyes remained open. It's incredible. You have to read those accounts. What about spiritual fruitage? Well, she wrote a book called Education. In that book, she said Seventh-day Adventists, Bible-believing Christians, should establish schools around the world. She's thought that Adventist young people should, should know the Bible for themselves, that they could help in the spreading of the gospel. How did you like seeing the young people up here leading the song service? Wasn't that a blessing to see? She said that our young people, they should be a part of the work. What's the spiritual fruitage? The largest Protestant educational system in the world. In fact, there, just recently, there was a public television documentary done called The Blueprint that featured Adventist education. Looking at the 7,600 schools, the colleges, the universities, over 80,000 teachers, over 1.5 million students. We see universities such as Loma Linda, one of the most prestigious medical schools in the world. Millions are treated each year. You, I could spend a long time telling you about these things that came out of her guidance. 
How about Florida Hospital? One of the most extensive and renowned health systems in the United States. If you go to Florida for a vacation, or if you're one of those, those winter birds that fly south, chances are you know about Florida Hospital. He gave visions and dreams to guide God's people to help move the gospel work forward. Seventh-day Adventists have established work in 202 of the 228 countries of the world listed by the United Nations. More work in more countries than any other Protestant denomination in the world. God has blessed incredibly. Many years ago, there's a young man. I love this story. I've told it so many times, but I love it every time. There was a young man in Africa. His name was Sakuba. It's a well-documented story. He goes to bed one night. He has a longing for truth in him. And he says, oh, big God of the stars, I feel empty in my heart. And he begins to plead with the God of heaven to take him to a place where he can learn truth. That night, 1953, an angel descends from heaven and visited the hut, and he said, follow me. Now, if that happened to you... <laughs> And my, you might be shaken up a little bit. But he had such a yearning in his heart. He began to walk. He went through field and jungle and prairie. He traveled through the African grasslands and deserts. The angel told him he would guide him to a people of the book. Well, he said, I cannot read the book. <laughs> the angel said, you'll be taught how to read. Don't worry. Follow You'll know the people of the book, he said, because they'll have a black book. You'll recognize it when you see it. But they'll also have four books that are really nine. Four books that are really what? Nine. Kept walking. He walked at night two weeks. He came to the edge of the jungle, found a Christian mission. He goes in and he says, I'm looking for the people of the book. And he's searching and they take him to the pastor of the Christian mission. And the guy says, we're the people of the book. We're a Christian mission. He says, but wait, I need to see the, the four books that are really what? Nine. Man said, what do you mean by that? He was confused. Well, that night... Sakuba went to bed, and the angel appeared to him again, and he said, Find Pastor Mayo and the Sabbath-keeping people. He'll have the four books that are really nine. Well, he got up in the morning, he started walking through fields, through the jungle, until he was led to a little Seventh-day Adventist mission. He comes into this mission, and he says, Is the pastor here? Pastor Mayo came out. Sakuba said, I've been guided by God to you. My whole tribe doesn't know about God. And, and I want to know the truth. He says, I've been led to you. Do you have the book? And the pastor said, I think I do. He went and he grabbed his Bible. He came outside. It was a, a well-read, studied black Bible. And he saw and he said, that's the book I saw in my vision. Pastor told him that, yes, we're a, we're a God-believing people. We believe the Bible. We believe in God's Ten Commandments. We honor all of them, even the Sabbath commandment. We worship God each Sabbath day. Sakuba said, but wait, do you have the four books that are really nine? Pastor had a smile on his face. He said, I do. He led him into his office, and there on his shelf, there were the four books that are really nine. You see, Ellen White, through her visions and dreams, she wrote out nine volumes. They're called Testimonies to the Church. She wrote about God's power to change lives, to help God's people go back to Scripture. But there are nine volumes published in four books. And there they were on the shelf. And he saw, and when he saw them, he said, yes, those are the books. I found God's people. He studied. He was baptized. He went back as a missionary to his tribe. And almost the entire tribe accepted Jesus and the Bible truths that many of you have been learning in this seminar. 
It is just amazing what God is doing. He's leading those who have a hungering for truth. For those who are honest hearted, those who want the Bible and the Bible alone, God is leading them. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says in the last days, God will have a special people. He promises to give his people a special gift. He's going to pull back the curtain a little bit wider for them to be prepared for the things that are coming. It's in harmony with his words. Not to take the place of the Bible, not to have a, the authority of the Bible, not to play, take the place of Jesus Christ, but to exalt Jesus. Jesus has given a special gift to guide and direct his people along that straight and narrow path that leads to the kingdom of heaven. To understand the word of God better. God wants us to be that people. God wants you to be that person. I want to stand and I want to sing a powerful hymn we're going to sing together, and I'm going to pray together. Let's stand as we sing this amazing, amazing hymn. Hymn number 413. Let's sing this hymn with strength and with power. Let's sing this hymn with all of our might. Let's glorify our Lord. God has
together. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for the guidance that you give. Lord, you have given us your word as that light to shine in a dark place. You have given gifts to your church to strengthen, to edify, to call to faithfulness. And in these last days, you are calling for a people. A people will st- that will stand upon the whole counsel of God. From Genesis to the Revelation. A people who will study and know their Bibles. A people who will say, this I stand upon because I have a thus, saith the Lord. People of confidence and courage. Because you have commanded us to be strong and very courageous. Oh Lord, thank you for the guidance. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. And while your spirit is calling and speaking to the church today, may there be a response. May our hearts yearn like this African tribalman as he longed for the truth and in his longing you answered his prayer. And you guided him. There are many that you have been sending. That you are guiding in their hearts. They know that you have been guiding. To deny that guidance would be to deny the guiding of the Holy Spirit. They know that in their heart because of the testimony of Scripture. Not the testimony of a man. But of the Word of God. If you would like to make a decision today. That you want to hold to the whole counsel of God. I just ask that you raise your hand where you are. Every head is bowed. Every eye closed. Say, Lord, I want to heed the full counsel of your word. Amen. Some of you have made decisions for baptism. Some of you have said, I want to take my stand for Jesus Christ. If that's you, raise your hand. Amen. Yes, we see those hands. Are there others that would like to join these who are preparing for baptism. We're going to plan for a baptismal service. We want you to be a part of that, to take your stand with Christ. That's you. I just ask that you raise your hand. Raise your hand where you are. Amen. Amen. God bless you for those decisions. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. He's calling you to take a stand. You want to study, you want to learn, but you want to stand with God's people in these last days. You want to take that commitment to the Lord at this hour. I just ask that you raise your hand where you are. Raise your hand for the Lord to see. Lord, please bless these decisions. As we go today, May our hearts go filled with courage that you are still leading your people. And that you're calling your people to be ready for your soon return. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, tonight, final message, Revelations, triumphant remnant. Do not miss tonight. Look forward to seeing you. God bless you.